Hi everyone and welcome to um, this uh, talk at the KRC International Forum, which is about uh, definitions of cybercrime, conceptualizations of cybercrime. And I'm going to talk about that challenge in relation to some research I've done recently about um, the way that cyber criminals generate revenues and function within a kind of what I call the cybercrime economy. Um, the challenge of defining cybercrime in a way, it seems like it's gone away. We, we, we all sort of think we know what cybercrime is, and I've argued against that. I think there's a number of challenges with how we define and explain cybercrime, and here's three that I've um, flagged up for you. First of all, there are the fundamental conceptual and definitional problems. Do we have a universalist approach? Do we try and think that there's a, a definition of cybercrime that covers all kinds of cybercrimes? Um, or do we think we can only apply certain definitions, the particularist approach, to particular um, cyber crimes, or thirdly, do we just think that the whole exercise is a waste of time? We're agnostic about it, we're skeptical about it, and we think let's just not bother about um, defining cyber crime. Let's just get on with policing it and enforcing it. Second related challenge is then if we do come up with a definition that we're satisfied with, to what extent does that fit with the evidence? Um, is the way that we define cyber crime something that cyber criminals are actually doing? Finally, thirdly. Is our definition, is our conceptualization of any use? Can we apply it on the ground to specific activities that cyber criminals are engaged in? And does it help us make sense or, or do something about it? And indeed, what are the connections here? Um, really, with cybercrime, we've got a, a, a fundamental challenge. Do we go with the fact that cybercrime appears to use technology and that the technology is fundamental to it? Or do we try and get around that and come up with a non-technological -de definition? Here's one example of something I did in my work um, a few years ago where I tried to develop a non-technological definition. And this focuses on the idea um, that, as, as with um, the idea of cyberspace, there's something spatial going on. And um, that spatiality comes from the kinds of connections that um, the internet and digital technologies um, enable us to engage in. Um, in fact, there are so many of these connections, whether it is um, to what we're saying, how we talk to people, how we access data, that many people now talk about the idea of hyper-connectedness, hyper-connection, we're in a hyper-connected world. And just as we used to think that um, engaging with computers created cyberspace, maybe hyperconnection, hyperconnectedness creates a kind of a hyperspace, um, in which case we derive then a nice little definition um, in the same way as cybercrime comes from cyberspace. Maybe we can think about hypercrime coming from hyperspace. Well, personally, I think this is a, this is a good and profitable direction to go on. But of course, most people um, don't use the concept of hypercrime. They still talk about cybercrime. So it looks like we're kind of stuck with the term and it looks like, therefore, we're stuck with a kind of technological definition. So when we think about the technologically driven definition of cybercrime, what we kind of think about is things like um, uh, cybercrime is the misuse of computers, that's certainly how it used to be defined, or maybe it's a misuse of digital technology. But there's a number of problems there with that, aren't there, once we start to drill down a bit. Um, is it computers, as people used to think, or is it, as people increasingly realised, it was about the network rather than the, com the, the computer? Um, can we even talk about computers? Are computers the same kind of thing now as they were in the 1990s when cybercrime began to emerge um, with cloud computing and so on? The, the, the computer as a device is increasingly less central. Um, so is it about the network or is it about um, other developments of the network, such as wireless technologies and, and um, uh, new developments coming down the line? In other words, we have a device impermanence. Um, the technology we use to define cybercrime is constantly changing, and that's not a good thing. Um, for conceptions and definitions. We want these to be, um, if, particularly if we want to be universal about them, we want to be permanent. Second problem is related to what does this technology do and how does it function within the definition? What, what kind of agency do we as human actors have in using the technology or is it all the technology that does the job? Um, and how do we cause anything? Is it us causing something or is it the, the device? And if it's the device causing it, then what, what relevance do we as human actors have? And some of you might be familiar with this challenge in that one of the standard um, uh, definitions of cybercrime, which relates to it as computer dependent crime, distribution of malware, viruses and so on, or cyber enabled crime, things like fraud, online sexual offending and so on. There's this big schism, this big conceptual divide, which I don't think really has been successfully bridged yet. Is cybercrime computer dependent or is cybercrime computer enabled? 
And that leads us to the third problem, the third challenge with a technological definition, which is right back with us, human actors. How do we account for human factors? How do we account for the role of the social world in our definition of cybercrime if technology is playing such a central definitional role? So how do we incorporate these human social factors um, into our definitions at the same time as avoiding what's sometimes called technological determinism, everything being decided by the technology? Well, in the research that I did, I, I tried to respond to this challenge by looking at what cyber criminals actually did. And one of the things that they do, clearly uh, most frequently, is try and make money, try and generate revenues. So starting from this point of revenue um, generation, um, it looked like it could answer the three challenges that I, that, that I mentioned earlier on. It, it seems like it might be a universal definition. It, it would enable us to, to map cybercrime activity as a whole. It seems like it could also be particular because it would tell us about what individual cyber criminals are doing at any given um, offending moment. It, it's, they're motivated by, by, by acquiring some value or some benefit to themselves. And finally, it does seem to have an applied dimension. If revenue generation is what's fundamental to cybercrime, then maybe we could use that to intervene to disrupt revenue networks and um, revenue flows. So the research this was based on is called the Web of Profit. There was three reports here. Um, I won't go into all of them now because of time. The first report, the Web of Profit itself, looked at the cybercrime economy, how much it generates. The second report looked at the, the role of certain elements of this economy, um, which is uh, social media platforms. How do they generate money? How do they enable cyber criminals? And then the third report looked at perhaps the more familiar aspect of what cyber criminals do in terms of, of hidden markets, the dark market, the invisible net, and so on. We used a, a variety of different methodologies for this piece of research. Um, there was uh, interviews that we conducted, um, some of it with actually convicted cyber criminals, and they told us how they were spending money and generating their money, practitioners and so on. We, we did a lot of observation. We looked at um, different social media platforms, both in um, the Europe and, and the West and Russia and China, which I think is a very important unexplored area uh, um, of cybercrime activity. We looked at um, what was going on on a sample of 15 darknet platforms over a, a specified time period. And we actually engaged with some of the vendors on those platforms, trying to do transactions, trying to buy and sell things. And then finally, we analyzed um, a lot of the data that we had, um, things like commodities that were being sold on darknet markets, what prices they were reaching. And then we looked at a whole variety of other bits of data and tried to, to find some patterns in that, social media posts, uploads, photos, and so on. Um, what we found was very complex and there were many, many things I could talk about here, but since we have very limited time, I'm going to talk about two things which could be specifically related to the question of definition. Um, the first one is, as I've kind of suggested, that revenue generation seems to suggest within cybercrime the emergence of something we can think of as a cybercrime economy. Um, and that points to the second finding, which is the need um, to develop a much better socioeconomic conception in our definitions of cybercrime. So the cybercrime economy clearly is, is a dynamic, it's, a, it's an economy of flows as the theorist uh, Manuel Castells once described it, um, the digital economy. It um, involves generating revenues. These revenues um, are then moved around in different ways. They're laundered, they're spent. Um, and in turn, they um, are, are reinvested sometimes in cybercrime, sometimes in other kinds of crime, things, you know, concerning things like terrorism. So it's a dynamic flowing thing. And our definitions of cybercrime have to reflect that, that inherent dynamism, I think. Um, like any economy, it's got certain fundamental features. Now, in our industrial or in, in, in industrial and service economies, we think about raw materials like metal and, and steel and coal, and they get fed into the economy and from them, they're turned into other things and wealth results. Well, of course, in the digital economy and the cybercrime economy as part of that, um, has its very, very own and unique raw material data. And that might be everything from the kind of company databases you can buy on the dark net through to things like loyalty points, um, likes and dislikes and social media sites. They're all things that can be traded in, that can be bought and sold, along with, you know, more, more familiar examples, such as our personal identification details. Um, like any economy, there are many ways in which wealth 
is generated. All economies are about wealth generation. The cybercrime economy, when you start to look at it, it's really surprising just how many ways now, it's not just simple data theft any longer. There's all kinds of ways in which cyber criminals can make money. So yes, they steal data and they trade in data, they buy and sell data, but they also do things like they buy tools and, and, and they, they sell tools. Um, they, they use um, their cybercrime skills and, and online resources to generate a huge volume of trade in things like counterfeit goods prescription pharmaceuticals, um, illegal drugs, and so on. Um, there is a trade in the buying and selling of skills, um, um, uh, using consultancy to, to improve your, um, your botnet or whatever it might be. Um, they, th there is a dedicated currency, which I'll come on to in a minute, which is bought and sold. Um, and there is a trade in things like company secrets, intellectual property. Um, there is money made from extortion, and so on. Um, I could you know, cite many other examples. But all of this is rooted, again, as I, as I just suggested, in, in a kind of a currency. And currencies are fundamental to economies. You know, economies can't, can't function unless there is a fluidity of, of, of exchange of value through transactions and buying and selling and so on. And of course, the digital economy and increasingly the cyber kind of economy trades on these digital currencies now, whether it's, you know, digital payment systems, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer banking um, and, and the, the hundreds really now of um, cryptocurrencies that now exist. The example of how important they are, it's estimated that around about $2.8 billion were, were laundered, money laundered over Bitcoin exchanges last year. That's a doubling from the previous year. So the currency element of the cybercrime economy is absolutely fundamental, so fundamental, but there are many, many other features as well. We all know about dark net markets um, and uh, dark web uh, situations. So these are dedicated marketplaces. Uh, familiar economies that you know the legitimate economy we think about things like the stock market like other kinds of marketplaces online marketplaces like ebay amazon and so on well cybercrime has got its own examples it's also got supply centers you know where where raw materials are processed and developed into wealth generating commodities and this example here of this famous romanian village village um is uh, a sometimes referred to as hackerville there's a huge hacker economy here um, that's been reported how big is this economy? Well, we measured it to be valued at around $1.5 trillion um, annually. And that, that's a conservative estimate for lots and lots of reasons, which I haven't got time to go into here. Um, but um, that's a staggering amount of money. Um, it breaks down kind of um, as follows in ways which we found a little bit surprising in the research. Actually, the biggest component of this economy is the, um, the, the, the trading that's done across um, illegal online markets with things like counterfeit goods, um, pharmaceuticals, and so on. About $860 billion per annum that's worth. Um, trade secret IP theft, about $500 billion. Trading in data, um, surprisingly, not quite so much, $160 billion. Right down to things like crimeware, which, of course, we associate as a paradigmatic cybercrime good, um, actually generating a lot less money than perhaps the, the, the less obvious types of activity within this economy. The fact that there's so much money being generated within the cyber crime economy, I think, has to be seen as something very significant. I mean, for example, just as a comparison, we can see that it um, generates more money than the combined revenues of the top three Fortune 500 companies. Um, it generates, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a amount of wealth and revenues which is larger than the um, GDP of many nation states, including states, you know, wealthy states like Saudi Arabia, and. Perhaps more importantly, it generates a huge amount of resources, and that means that new cyber criminals are constantly coming into the field because they want a piece of the action. Um, it, allow, it allows, as I've suggested, um, quite a significant volume of money to be reinvested back into cyber crime and crime. It, it blends with the legitimate economy and distorts it um, in ways which I'll come back to in a minute. And as a result, it fosters the um, interest of other larger actors, amongst them nation states, to, to get involved in cybercrime. So the idea of, the, um, of, uh, of the, the fact that the legitimate economy becomes blurred with the um, cybercrime economy, I think is something that's very significant, and we're only beginning to, to make sense of this. I mean, money laundering, I've already mentioned. The fact that um, you know, there's huge amounts of money being laundered in the world, increasingly a lot of that comes from the cybercrime economy, and increasingly um, you know, legitimate actors like banks, you know, we know the famous um, case with HSBC, 
um, the, the global laundromat scandal that, that, that took place a couple of years ago when HSBC was found to be involved in um, enabling laundering on a global scale. So the cybercrime economy as it grows is distorting the legitimate economy um, and, and making actually the, the boundary between crime and non-crime harder to trace. Um, and one of the ways in which this blurring is, is taking place is by a new kind of cybercrime tool. And I'm writing a book about this at the moment called Platform Criminality. And this is the digital platform. Many people, and um, the, for example, the writer Nick Chernikek has uh, written a book called Platform Capitalism. Um, and he suggests that uh, just as, say, a uh, generation of, of industrial goods in the early industrial revolution was one of the, the, the big ways in which wealth was generated. Now, the most money being generated in the legitimate economy comes from digital platforms like Facebook, like Amazon, um, like eBay, and so on. And um, we have a, a range of platforms in the cybercrime world, whether it's darknet markets, whether it's other sort of personal forums that cybercriminals use to buy and sell goods. The platform becomes a new kind of cybercrime tool. And with it becomes, from a criminological perspective, I think a very, very interesting development in the crime is no longer the primary activity, the activity of a cyber criminal for generating wealth. There's a first order level of crime, perhaps where data is stolen or a hack is done. But then the commodities generated from that go into this wider economy and you get a kind of what I call second order criminality, a trading of crime upon crime. Um, and I think this is a historic change in, in the nature of what crime and criminality is. So to conclude, uh, last couple of slides, what should we do um, and, and how does this cybercrime economy affect how we define cybercrime? Well, one um, approach is, as I highlighted in the beginning of the talk, to take what might be called the sceptical agnosticist approach. Say, we don't do anything. Who cares? You know, all we can do is get on with identifying what cyber criminals do and helping law enforcement then disrupt that. You could go to a, another end of the scale and say, well, look, actually, this is so significant. We've got to throw out our old definitions of cybercrime completely and come up with something new, maybe a kind of a hypercrime type idea. Or perhaps what it means is that um, cybercrime will increasingly um, be defined in terms of its particular activities, the particularist approach. So what we will get is a kind of a fragmented field of cybercrime, um, which certain activities are foregrounded over others. So you have the kind of economic financial cybercrime, which I've been talking about in this um, discussion, which of course is by far the largest, generates the largest volume of cybercrime activity and the most revenues. But then you have other um, types of activity that we're also concerned about, other ways in which online digital technology cause harm, such as sexual cybercrime perhaps, um, uh, hate speech online, hate-based cybercrime, and so on. This could be one future um, for how we define cybercrime, to fragment it into these different definitions. Or, to conclude, it may be, and this is something that I think a lot of people have considered, that cybercrime or digital technology becomes such a fundamental um, activity or such a fundamental tool for criminals to use that actually there's no difference between crime and cybercrime any longer. Every crime, to some extent, is enabled by digital technology, whether you're planning you know, a bank robbery by talking to somebody over the internet, um, whether you're using 3D copiers to, um, to make guns and, and getting plans and, and blueprints for that over the internet. Maybe at every level in the next 10 to 15 years, um, digital crime is going gonna, is gonna to permeate crime in general so that we won't need um, a definition of cybercrime at all. Either way... Um, the question of definition and the question of conceptualization, which is often forgotten about when we think about cybercrime, because we are very target fixated. We are very um, fixated on um, you know, measuring what cyber criminals are doing. I'd like to conclude by reminding all of us that we shouldn't forget that defining cybercrime is fundamental to how we think about cybercrime. If we don't get that right, then we might as well forget the whole business from square one. Thank you very much for um, listening to this talk, and um, I shall look forward to answering some of your questions um, when you put them forward to me. Thank you very much.